Thank you, Norm. Good morning. Welcome to Amelia Methodist Church this morning. I'm so glad you're here. And if you are joining us from home, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to mess up the sound booth uh, there a little bit. And Norm, would you play happy birthday for us? So if you have a birthday in October, could you please stand? And we would like to sing happy birthday to you. I hope you have had and continue to have a wonderful birthday month. Um, now, we are going to watch a video on Operation Christmas Child. So sit back and relax. I just recently went to my very first packing party and I've been packing boxes since I was a little girl. And the impact that that had on my family was incredible. It's actually a day I'll never forget because of the joy and the fun I saw in my kids. And I saw a whole church community come together. It didn't matter what age they were. They were serving together inside their community. Father, we're so deeply thankful for uh, the ministry of Operation Christmas Child. What a grand adventure that we get to be a part of. Would you take these gifts and would you use them to open children's hearts to the gospel of Jesus Christ? God, we are so thankful for the opportunity to pack these boxes. And Lord, we pray for these boxes. Lord, that when they open this up, they will hear about the love through your son, Jesus. It challenged me that day. It challenged me to think bigger. It challenged me to be praying that God would use me here in my community with my children's lives, the people in their lives, to reach out to them. We serve a holy God, a God that's called us to serve the world. And these packing parties are a great opportunity to serve here in our own community. There's power on this side of the box. When you invite people from your community, from your church, or from your sports team, from your kids' school, it gives us an opportunity here on this side of the box to share the gospel of Jesus. And so I want to encourage you, and I want to challenge you to pray to see how God would use you to impact your community, starting with a box. As excited as your children and grandchildren are on Christmas morning to open up gifts, these children are just as excited to get their boxes. Um, so if you could fill your box and bring it in, and I'm going to say November 17th, 19th, does anybody know? Okay, it, 17th, thank you, 17th, bring that on in and um, we'll get those sent off for you. Um, Rebecca Circle Meeting, there will be a Rebecca Circle Meeting today after church, right after church in the Fellowship Hall. Tonight um, is the children's musical practice from 6 to 7.30. Uh, the musical is going to be What in the World is Christmas, which I think sounds very exciting. Um, also, back to Rebecca Circle, you have been handed a flyer. There is a craft fair on the 2nd. So next Saturday, or this coming Saturday, is a craft fair. Please come out and enjoy um, all the craft booths that we have. Kathy. I just want to talk about a new ministry that's starting here at Amelia. Years ago, there was a knitting and crocheting group, but it kind of fell apart over time. So we're resurrecting that, and we're calling it Psalm 139 Ministry. You will see in your bulletins that it's called that, and may not, uh, may not uh, recognize that as a knitting and crocheting ministry. It's a knitting and crochet group meeting together in fellowship, using our skills to, move, to make items to spread God's love and comfort. 
we're planning on doing a variety of items. We want people to bring their favorite um, things that they're working on right now. And we'll decide as a group whether they're going to make like chemo caps, prayer shawls, um, hats and gloves and uh, scarves. But come on this day, we have it twice a month. Once will be during the day at um, 9.30 to 11.30, the second Thursday of the month, which will be the 14th of November coming up. The other one will be daytime on um, the fourth Monday, and it'll be from um, 6 to 8 p.m. So come and be a part of that. If you think you might want to learn to crochet, we're going to hook you up with that. And I'm going to teach a couple people so far how to do just that. But come if you think you might be interested and support our ministry. Thank you very much. We're going to be getting uh, next Sunday night and running for five weeks uh, through the first Sunday in uh, uh, December. We're going to be uh, doing the video series, How Shall We Then Live, uh, Francis Schaefer put together. A number of you have been wanting to be a part of that, and uh, so we will do that again. We'll be in the fellowship hall. It'll be on Sunday nights at 6. I'm putting it right at that time because those of you that are parents of children, you can bring the kids for practice and then come and join us in the fellowship hall uh, while they're practicing for the videos and the discussion. So I hope that you'll do that. It's a really uh, important study. And uh, some of you have done it before, but if you're like me, you have to do it over and over and over again before you actually, it actually sinks in uh, what he's talking about. It's not the easiest thing in the world. So we hope that you'll do that. That'll start next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, and we'll be running for five weeks. We'll be done the first week in December before we get into the uh, heat of the holidays. So plan on being with us on Sunday nights at 6. And now let us silence our hearts and our minds and welcome the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ into our worship and the, into this place with silent prayer. Amen. This morning, I will be reading from Psalm 2, verses 6 through 8. Um, this is, uh, Pastor Ed's been talking about the Trinity. This is a conversation, actually, between God and uh, Christ. But it is also a message to us that we can always come and ask for whatever it is that we need. I have instilled my king on Zion my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have several prayer announcements, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Becky, Betty Creighton requests prayer for her daughter, Tammy Rogers. She is having a CT scan um, on Tuesday morning, so pray that she gets good results. She also requests prayer for Gemma Mathers. She's a neighbor of her daughter. Gemma is a beautiful 13-year-old that has anorexia and refuses to eat or drink. She's been in the hospital for several weeks, so please pray that God will encourage her to start eating and to heal her and touch her heart. Um, from Judy Shepard and Diane Birch, please pray for our sister Barbara. On Wednesday, she'll be having a biopsy, 
and um, we need to pray that she has no cancer, and we know God can, will answer those prayers. Um, please pray for Dennis, a friend of Renee. He has been hurt. Um, Sarah Ertle has blood clots again, so please pray for her. Um, please pray for the healing and the comfort of uh, Kathy Stapleton's dad. He had knee replacement last Tuesday. And on the same vein as knee replacement, Pastor Russ is also requesting prayers. He had knee replacement on Monday. Um, he is in some pain, so he needs uh, prayers, and he thanks you for those prayers that have already been received. So please um, keep these people in your prayers this week. Thank you.
If the ushers will come, we'll receive our morning offering. Father in heaven, we praise your name for all that you have given to us. Now, Lord, we give to you the tithe, which is rightfully thine own. And above the tithe are gifts for the advancement of your kingdom. Bless each gift and giver, and these you wait on your congregation. We ask, Lord, in thy name. Amen. This is the second song, and this is the first one. Yes, our God.
your presence we need your presence in our lives 
And what a joy to know that you have given us your spirit. That your spirit is a spirit of truth. It's a spirit of love, the spirit of unity and peace. Father, may we walk in that spirit. And may he fill our lives. May he renew our minds. May he give us pure hearts. May he put a right spirit within us. And Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would so live in our hearts and our lives that the fruit of the Spirit would be the fruit of our lives. As the Spirit draws us to you, your word tells us that the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin, that he'll show us the ways of righteousness, and that he'll lead us into the truth. He is the Spirit of truth. So Holy Spirit, do your work in our hearts this morning, we pray. Be upon us in a powerful way. And Lord, we just look to you. You can do in us what we cannot do in ourselves. Have your way among us, we pray. We ask in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. You might have noticed, maybe you didn't. First song that they sang was about the Father. The second was about Jesus. Third was about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Trinity, three in one. Well, we've been studying in Sunday school in our classes and um, the children downstairs. And uh, my Sunday school class has uh, learned a song about the Holy Spirit. And so my class is going to come and sing. We have one not here. Langston's not with us this morning, but Langston knows it really well too. So I'm going to ask my Sunday school class to come up real quick. Come on, guys. Come on. Come on, Bella. No, just that. We can do it. You can turn my mic off. <laughs> Amanda and Jody and Wendy, they help a lot in the class. you guys sing it with them so we make sure that you know it now you should know it by now and I'll let my class go ahead and lead you you guys ready ready go. Trinity, right. Very good, guys. You can go to junior church now. Kids are dismissed for junior church. Good job. Good job. Kids.
they were excited. That's why they were kind of antsy up and through here because they're excited. Today was going to be their day to sing. But uh, the kids, uh, you know, it's uh, ironic um, that like last week we were talking about uh, the sacrifice of Isaac to Abraham and how God stopped him, but then God sacrificed his own son that Jesus died for us. And like I mentioned last week, one of them, they're getting the idea, one of them said, well, that means that God died for us because Jesus is part of the Trinity of God. So a part of God died when Jesus died, which was pretty good observation. Uh, the three-year-olds didn't come up with that, but some, one of the older ones did that's in the other classroom. But uh, uh, that, they did a good job. We're going to be in John chapter 17. I want to share some things that are pretty deep this morning, so you're going to need to hang on uh, and try to grasp it. If I can't get it all done today, we'll finish it next week, okay? Uh, but I'm going to try to. What's that? Or you can just stay. Yeah, we can do that too. <laughs> we can just go till I get done. Somebody told me once, I don't need a clock on Sunday mornings. I need a calendar. <laughs> So, and it may be sometimes. But it's exciting, the Word of God is. The truth is exciting. And the Word is exciting because it is life-changing and it is truth. And Christianity is true. I just had a funeral just this week, obviously, uh, David's funeral. Whether or not it's true matters when we stand before the grave, doesn't it? That's when it becomes significant. Is this the real truth of the universe? Or are we fooling ourselves? That becomes the real issue. And at that time, it's a critical issue. Uh, so it really does matter. And it's, it is truth. It fits the universe we live in. It fits the world we live in. It describes the condition of man. It describes the condition of the world as fallen from what God originally intended, and then it shows us the solution of how we can get back to God and how we can be forgiven of our sins and the grace of God. So it's, 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 it's really important to us. I want to read John chapter 17 to you. I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's part of this discourse that took place in the upper room right after the Last Supper, what we call, they had finished the meal. Jesus has been teaching them for three chapters now. And now he finishes with a prayer. And then it says in some of the other Gospels, after they had prayed, then they, when they had finished praying, actually it starts chapter 18. When they had finished praying, Jesus left with the disciples Across the Kidron Valley to the other side, there was an olive grove, and he, his disciples, went in the Mount of Olives. He goes there to pray, and they're going to arrest him just hours later. So this is one of the last things he does before he's arrested, this prayer. Listen to the prayer that he prays. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven, and he prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, so that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. 
Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and I kept them safe by the name that you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you to protect them from the evil one. They're not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Let us pray. Father, teach us what this prayer means. Lord, what a prayer. May it come home to us, Lord. Lead us, give us wisdom. Give us understanding. And may everything that Jesus prayed become true in our lives. Teach us your word this morning, we pray. And Holy Spirit, be upon everything. We ask it, Lord, in your name. Amen. The concept of Trinity, the Trinity of God, is a difficult concept, and yet it's one that we can grasp in many ways. The children grasp it in certain ways, and obviously they're kind of getting the hang if they can relate the death of Christ to the Trinity. God is one God. The great statement in the Old Testament to Israel is, Behold, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And yet he exists in three persons. And that there's such a unity between those three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a unity of love, respect, power, but total unity between the three. You can't break it apart. To the point that Jesus, being a distinct part of it, can pray, Father, if it's possible, let this pass from me, this cup. But not mine will, but thine be done. In other words, we see in Jesus this unity, and yet Jesus is distinct. He can think thoughts different. He can pray to the Father. And yet the overriding thing is to do the will of the Father, and that unity and that perfection that we find within the Trinity. Now I want to suggest something to you. Could you imagine one breaking that apart? If somehow this trying God broke apart, which it would shatter the universe. But God in his perfection, that never will happen because he is perfect in everything that he does. 
And then he creates the man and he says of the man and the woman, I'm going to create, let's create them in our image. We have often looked at that as signs of, well, what are the characteristics of God? The characteristics of God then are the characteristics he made for us. What he doesn't like, what he doesn't, that's what we're made for. And we've understood it that way, but what if he means something a little different there? And I think you pick it up in the prayer. What if we're to live with God in the concept of Trinity? God in us and us in God, that perfect union that he had in the garden where he would come down in the cool of the day. Distinct individuals, and yet there's a oneness. There, there's, a, there's a beauty in their creation. Everything is good, and they can walk with God. He comes and walks with them in the cool of the day, and there's nothing to break the unity until they rebel. And then it's shattered. No wonder it's brought such havoc into the world. Because when they rebelled, it broke that whole unity and it, the, whole, the whole planet was shaken by it. So that even nature itself, man, no longer can have dominion over nature. Nature tries to have dominion over us. And the whole thing is broken apart. Because they rebelled against God, they broke it. They broke the unity and it shatters it. This whole concept of different individuals and yet oneness. Oneness. I think we find it reflected in the marriage. Because in the marriage, the concept of marriage is almost a trinity conscious when you, uh, connection when you think about it. A man and a woman, distinct personalities, distinct individuals, but the two are joined together with God and it's, they become one. One being, characterized by love, just like the Trinity. When you begin to view it in those kinds of terms, and that it's used that way all through the scriptures, they become one. They're no longer two, they're one. And, and, and a, a, a unit is established here of two people together. They remain distinct individuals just like the Trinity does. And yet they are one together and hopefully with God so that the, 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 the uh, husband is supposed to uh, always obey God the Father. The woman is to stand under her husband and the whole thing is unified. One being, one unit. So that when we divorce, we rip it apart. And that unity is destroyed. The Bible warns us about that in Scripture. You see, if we want to think individually and think on our own, which is what Adam and Eve did, you can be like God, you can think, you can decide good and evil yourself, you won't need God. You can become an individual equal with God rather than part of that unity of God. And that's what actually happens in the fall. They break it. And that's what breaks our marriages when we come to think independently and individually rather than as a unit. And it breaks it. And it tears it apart. Now Jesus prayed here that the believers would be one and that the church was to be one. That the believers, those who make up the church, are to be one together with God, with one another. And it's got to be a, a unit that's characterized by love for one another. He's talked about love all through this discourse, that we're to love one another. He's talked to us about loving God by obeying God. He's talked to us about what the Holy Spirit would do in our hearts and in our lives. All that's been part of this sermon that he's been preaching, he's been giving to them, this teaching. And he culminates with this prayer, and his prayer is that they might be one. 
That there's to be a unity to where it's made up of individuals and persons, and yet there's a oneness together. It's almost like Trinity again, although it's not just a oneness with one another, but it's also, he said, that they might be one with us. They in me and I in them. A oneness that holds together, made up of individuals, but one. This concept is all through. You and I are to be one body together. Paul even describes it that way, you remember, in Corinthians. He says we are one body. One body. Many members, different skills, different parts to the body, but it's one body. So that if we fight against our one another, we're fighting ourselves. He even uses that in the marriage thing, talking to the man. He says, if you mistreat your wife or if there's a refusal there, you're, you're, you're fighting against your own body. And when part of your body fights the other parts of your body, medicine would tell us that's not a good thing. <laughs> that leads to death. We're created to be one. Trinity. We're to live Trinitarian lifestyles. To where there's a oneness. And the only way that, that can, we can have that oneness is when we forget ourselves as individuals and see ourselves as part of that body of Christ. That we are individually together. Each part has its own function. There's the arms that do the arm work, the hands, the heart, the liver. Whatever part you may be, you may be the big toe. But it's got its place in the body. And so Paul says, I can, how can I say to one of the other parts, I don't need you? Because without them, it's not a whole body. And you'll notice this. It's not just that it's a body that's connected between the, all of us together. But Jesus is the head. He's part of the body. The head not only directs, but it is part of the body. It's Trinity again. God, us as individuals, us together. And it was intended to be that way from the beginning. When sin came and we decided we could go our own way, it not only separated us from God, but it separated us from each other. So that you and I have always found that it's much easier to build a wall than it is to build a bridge. This concept of Trinity is all through, and Jesus is praying here. My prayer, don't take them out of the world. What I want, want is make them one. Let them be one. No longer individuals. One. One with each other. One with Christ. Because he's part of the body. He's the head. And it's the head where we look for our instruction. It's the head that guides us. Now God in Trinity, the one thing about God that we can be relieved about is that his love and his character is so perfect that he has perfection and that Trinity will never break apart. It will always be one. But you and I are not that way. You and I are fallen. And you and I are finite. And it seems like we can forever break that unity, can't we? We can break it in our marriages because we become selfish. We become self-absorbed. We can break it in the church by becoming selfish and self-absorbed, full of ego. 
And Jesus' prayer is that that all has to go because in the church, the, 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 the greatest characteristics that have to be in the church is going to be the characteristics of grace and forgiveness. Because we were always can be fighting against ourselves. Grace and forgiveness become very much necessary in the church, don't they? If we're not willing to forgive one another and show grace to one another, we can't ever heal the, the, the divisions that come up. We can, we can never heal them without that. If, we, if we're so, so into our egos that we can't say I'm sorry or ask to be forgiven, how in the world do we bridge the gaps? How do we build the bridge that can keep us together? And can bring us back again. So the Bible talks over and over. That's why Jesus in this teaching emphasizes over and over. Love one another. Love one another. If you aren't going to practice love with one another. This body isn't going to be able to hold together. There's not going to be the unity of the body. We have to be full of grace. We have to be full of forgiveness. When someone wrongs us, we don't take account of it. We just forgive and go on. Even if they don't ask for forgiveness, we forgive and go on. I imagine some of the, we've got psychologists sitting out here. I imagine they might tell us that that's necessity anyhow in life. Otherwise, you're going to be torn apart all the time. <laughs> Jesus wants us to be one. You and I won't get the perfection the Trinity, Trinity has, God has. But we can be full of grace and we can be willing to forgive and we can be full of mercy and we can die to our ego so that we're ready to say I'm sorry or that I messed up. Will you forgive me? And then we give grace to one another. Together, you and I form the body. We can't survive if there isn't unity in the body. We have to walk in unity. We have to forgive and we have to be forgiven. And Jesus is the head. And when it all operates the way it should, I would suggest to you we live in Trinity. And in our marriages, when we have that sense of unity, with Jesus as the head of the marriage, remember the husband is to always obey him and reflect him and to treat the wife the same way that Jesus treated the church. He's the head. Individuals, he never takes our individuality away. Jennifer's still going to be Jennifer. I'm going to still tell the same bad jokes. <laughs> Those are our personalities and who we are as people. But he's called us to be one. One together and one with him. So that we are in him and he is in us. Jesus living in us through his Holy Spirit. God in us. And there's perfect unity. That's what Jesus is praying for. For the church, for these believers. Some are fishermen, some are tax collectors, some are zealots, some are men, some are women. The women were there too. His prayer is that they will be one and that they will be in him and he in us. And I want to suggest to you, his prayer isn't just for them. He says, but all those who will believe through them. That includes you and me. That's his prayer for us, is that we be one. And that each of us as the part of the body we are will function as that part of the body. And together, we make up the body of Christ. 
And it goes beyond this because this is a body that is a body that extends to all believers all around the world. They are in the same body with us. All true believers, those who have really given themselves to Christ and believe and are a part of his body, they're all part of us, no matter what denominational tag they may have on their heads. Those that are truly in him are also part of us. And when we mistreat one another, we're mistreating ourselves. We're mistreating our own body. And we need to think about that clearly. Those tags don't matter. The unity of the body does. And we need to keep ourselves unified. And we have to be gracious, willing to ask for forgiveness because we don't have perfection. We don't have it. Does it surprise you when something goes wrong in the church or somebody gets upset with somebody in the church? It shouldn't because that's who we are, right? We are the church. The church is only as spiritual as you and I are. There ain't anybody else. It shouldn't surprise us. But we have to give forgiveness to one another. We can't hold grudges. We can't make it worse. We have to check our egos. I was going to say check them at the door, but really we don't want those even outside the door. Those don't do us any good outside the door either. They break up our homes, and they break us, they break us divisions between us and the people we work with and that we play with and that we live around as well. We've got to get rid of it. Jesus' prayer, may they be one. Just like I and the Father and the Spirit are one. It's that same unit, type of unity. That's what he wants us to have with him, with us, with each other. That's Trinitarian living. And that's a call Christ gives to us. Let's live. Let's don't talk about the Trinity, the God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We want to talk about that. But let's live the Trinity lifestyle. Oneness together. Father, may your prayer be answered. May Jesus' prayer for us be answered, Lord. May we experience that unity together so that we don't think of ourselves individually, but we think ourselves together as one body with Jesus Christ as the head. That we might be Trinitarian people who actually live that way in fellowship with you and in fellowship with the people around us. Restore us, we pray, that we might be what you made us to be. And we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to join our closing song. Father, what such wonder and beauty we see in the relationship within the Trinity. Such love. And Lord, we see such love that you pour out on us as you invite us to come to you. 
But Father, we're finite. We don't have perfection. And so you have given us love and mercy and grace. Lord, may we live in that Trinitarian lifestyle together, one with one another, one with you. May our lives be filled with grace and mercy and love. We pray it in your name. Amen. Thank you.